Good, good. Hey, good to see you guys. Um, we got just one announcement tonight, and that's just a reminder. Um, if you haven't grabbed the Desire of Ages, um, make sure you grab one of those. It's a great um, story about, on the life of Christ. So make sure you pick one of those up. Um, we're going to get started with our health presentation. So let's give a round of applause for Dr. Arvey. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, Cheryl, for picking me up. <laughs> our car won't start. Thank you. Oh, there you go. Okay, hold on. I didn't know I sent. Oh. Oh, you want to go further down? Yeah. Here. Okay, so we're starting on the first T, which is temperance. I hear a lot from my mom. She is a very temperate uh, lady. And what is temperance? It's moderation in the use of healthy substances and abstinence, complete abstinence from unhealthy substances. So when they say moderation in all things, that is really not accurate because there's really no healthful moderate cigarette smoking. To get it. So there are things that you should really abstain from completely. Um, can you have too much of a good thing? Yes. Even in the new start principles, too much nutrition leads to weight beyond what you should carry in your knees, right? Too much water actually is dangerous. Your sodium can go down and you can get seizures and confusion. So too much salt is not good. Anything good even if it's worthwhile, can be dangerous if it's too much. Too much sunlight can cause sunburn, which causes melanoma. So it's the sunburn that causes skin cancer. So why complete abstinence? I was looking through um, pages of addiction medicine, and they really say complete abstinence. You cannot um, get rid of something if you sometimes indulge in it. First, those bad things are not good for you, so why, why use them? Second is unhealthy substances have an addictive nature. They want you to want them, and if you don't need it, you can, you can have enough of it. If you don't need something, there is no enough of it. And you're trying to retrain your tastes and preferences. He's, here's a good statement. We have the ability to choose our own pleasures. We did not get born with a taste for alcohol or cigarettes or all of these noxious substances. If we reward ourselves with a bad habit periodically, we undermine our ability to develop enjoyment for a lifestyle that is free of that agent. We feed the habit and it will never completely go away. And then some say, oh, we're just gonna substitute one addiction with another. That's not successful, it has to be every addiction. So some people out of rehab, if they stop doing, let's say, narcs, then they pick up an alcohol habit. So it has to be complete abstinence from those that are unhealthy. So are these restricting my freedom? Contrary to that, they give you freedom. In a world of sin, God has given us these bounds of laws. And these are the health laws, like the Ten Commandments. If you work within those laws, then you will be happy, healthy, which is what he originally wants. So they would like to tell you, oh, that's, that's so strict. Why can't I have a drink here and there? It is within those laws that God knows he created us, right? He knows what's best for us. And he gave us all of these natural resources to be better. Now, if I tell you the truth, will I still be your friend? What is the most common substance abuse in America? More than 90% of people drink caffeine. Oh, okay. I have a confession, I've been recovering caffeine dependent. During residency, I worked more than 80 hours a week and my water was caffeine. Eight to nine glasses a day. On the weekend, I get a terrible headache, I have to drink coffee, and then I'm like, don't talk to me. I haven't had my coffee yet. When I realized that, I'm like, and then when I was interviewing for school, uh, do you have free coffee here? It was so driving. So <laughs> I'm like, I cannot do this. This is um, gripping me, do you see? There is no freedom there. 
you're under control of a substance that your brain said you need. Now, what is, the, so my patients would say when I give them a water prescription, which I usually do, um, it, does coffee count? It's actually negative, it's a diuretic. You drink, you pee, right? So, and then it increases stress hormone or cortisol, which in turn increases your blood pressure and your blood sugar. They're finding out that caffeine is an independent risk for diabetes. That's uh, from Cleveland Clinic uh, article. It causes palpitations, right? And then you're anxious because you're on high cortisol. You have tremors in your hand. You're chronically fatigued because you're always hyped. You're advancing your energy. You can't sleep. And then you have withdrawal symptoms like the headache, like I, I've told you. And it creates a physical dependence. That's why you have withdrawal, which make you drink. So um, the good thing is, if you withdraw from caffeine, it will only take three to five days, and then you're back to your normal. Now, this is what they say. Oh, I needed to perk myself up in the morning. Here's a study at Bristol University. They found out that although frequent consumers feel alerted by caffeine, especially by their morning tea or coffee or other caffeine-containing drink, like your soda, evidence indicates that this is actually merely the reversal of the fatiguing effects of acute caffeine withdrawal. It was just bringing to you back to where you were. So I'm sorry, but I feel compelled to give you this message. So the other addictions that we will explore lead to depression and anxiety, and it, it gets a grip on you. We know of people who are struggling to stop A, B, C, D, but they apparently can't find it. Alcohol is one, my patients. How about moderate alcohol drinking? Okay, moderate drinking is the school of excessive drinking. That's where it begins. You don't know when to stop. People who are recovering alcoholic can never taste alcohol again. Um, narcotics, as you know, that's a big problem. Everywhere, not just in this county. Benzodiazepines, that's your Xanax, uh, Ativan, very addictive. My psychiatry professor said, what is the difference between Xanax and true love? Xanax lasts forever. It stays longer than true love. Meat eating is stimulating. Sugar is addictive. We talked about that. It stimulates that part of the brain that cocaine does too. Chocolate, American Psychological Association, 40% of women are addicted to chocolate. Gambling. If you want to lose all your 401k overnight, this is the way to do it. Entertainment TV, what they found out is that constant scene change. Every three seconds, the scene would change, scene would change. So you're glued there. That's very addictive. Video games, oh, let's not introduce those to kids. I, I really feel so sorry when all they talk about are video games. Techno addict, you see people in the room where everybody's around, but they choose to text somebody who's not there. I, I have witnessed that. Internet entertainment, you think you're doing something, but you're not. Facebook, oh, I hope somebody liked my post. How many likes did I get? Why didn't you like my post? Right? <laughs> Caffeine, we talked about that. Sports, oh, it's so... <laughs> okay, the quote was, these uh, people watching, these people who need exercise, watching 22 people who need rest. Right, and you're at the edge of your seat. That's like heart attack. All your cortisol goes up, and then so when I remember after I think Seahawks lost, I had so many hypertensive patients the following days. Um, no heart attack, so that's good. Music syncopated, you know, out of rhythm because we have a natural rhythm. Our heart has a natural rhythm. When you listen to music against that rhythm, it can be addictive. Also, like. Um, multi-rhythmic elements. Pornography, that's a problem. Maybe it's not out there like alcoholism, but in the secret room, it's a problem. Deviant sexual practices is an addiction, which makes people not enjoy normal monogamous relationships. And cutting, so I heard of somebody who was cutting, I thought it was suicidal, apparently not. They cut themselves and when the blood comes out, it's like a release, like a Xanax to them. So it's becoming more and more um, common. What does the Bible say? This is a beautiful verse from Romans 12, 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to, to God, 
which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So I don't know which one of those is gripping us in this room or those who may be um, listening to this later on, but is there hope for us? You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. What you thought was good, now you know maybe it's not. You can do your research. Even Mayo Clinic in their website said avoid caffeine entirely. They're catching up after 100 or so years. And if you feel it gripping you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What is Jesus' invitation? Take up your cross and follow me. Is that cross nicotine? Is it alcohol? Is it coffee, chocolate, gambling, pornography? Let's take up that cross, give it to him, and follow. Thank you. He went to Galilee, for he himself had said, prophets are not respected in their own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the people there welcomed him, because they had gone to the Passover festival in Jerusalem and had seen everything that he had done during the festival. Then Jesus went back to Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. A government official was there whose son was sick in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to go to Capernaum and heal his son who was about to die. None of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and wonders. Sir, come with me. Before my child dies. Go. Your son will live. A man believed Jesus' words and went. On his way home, his servants met him with the news. Your boy, he's going to live. He asked them what time it was when his son got better. It was one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. Then the father remembered that it was at that very hour when Jesus had told him. Your son will live. So he and all his family believed. This was the second miracle that Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. If, um, if that was Cornelius in the book of Acts. Huh? <laughs> okay. Hi, Evan. Well, hey there, Pastor Hey, Ed. it's good to see you all that have braved uh, these, these um, my goodness, we have had a string of weather. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, it's so good to see, uh, see all of you stalwarts. Um, and uh, I, I was just thinking, you know, tonight is night eight. Yeah. We, uh, for, for some of you, you're getting very close to that threshold of 12. Yes, yeah. keep going there. Now, now um, it, we, that doesn't mean that when you hit 12 and you get your, your DVD that mm -hmm. you stop coming. We would still love to have you come. 
<laughs> true, true. <laughs> now, uh, Pastor Rick, on the twelfth night, would they get it on the twelfth night, or would we they get it after that? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna. Um, Is that still in the works? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're getting them in here. So. All right, good yes. news, good news. Yeah. Well, hey, I got a question for you, Pastor Rick. This we want to give the... an immediate reward. Yeah, that'd good. be great. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Wow. At midnight that night. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, we got a question from last night for you, All right. right. And Very good. The, the question is this. Um, I memorized it. The question was, um, oh, I forgot it. No. Just <laughs> Does the 1,260 days have a correlation between 19, or 1844. With 1844. Yep. Okay. Um, actually, uh, the, the uh, 1260 days were tied to the little horn power in the, in the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. And uh, 538 BC is when that, uh, when that time period began. 538 BC. And uh, what had happened was that was the last kingdom that was rooted out, remember the three horns were displaced by the little horn in, uh, in Daniel 7, and so that was the last kingdom. The Ostrogoths mm -hmm. were eliminated because they opposed the Roman, uh, the Roman church, and that, that started the time period. So then it was 1260 years mm -hmm. of, um, of persecution of mm -hmm. God's people. And so that spirit uh, of, uh, of persecution was alive, and toward the uh, toward into the uh, Protestant Reformation period, mm -hmm. we saw Protestants having that same spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so that time period ended in 1798. Okay. Um, so it 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 doesn't have a direct correlation with that, but in 1798, the the thing that happened was. General Berthier, under the orders of uh, Napoleon in France, crossed over the Alps, took the Pope into captivity, and took him back mm. to, uh, to France, and the Pope died in, pr in prison. So that was that deadly wound. Gotcha. Um, but what is happening is there, uh, and this is in Revelation chapter 13, mm -hmm. there is another power that is ascending mm. uh, in that time period. So... Um, so this is actually sitting um, independent. It's that period of persecution. Um, and it, it has kind of a dotted line to 1844. And uh, we'll, see, we'll see more of, of that. But 1844 is directly involved with the 2300 days that started mm -hmm. in 456 BC. Gotcha. I hope that helps. <laughs> yes, and it sounds like we'll, we're going to learn more on it as well in the future. Ones. Yes, there'll 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 still be some All things right. that we're going to touch right. on there. Awesome. And you know, I have to I have to tell you, you have um, <laughs> I I feel like uh, my head is caved in by the end of the night when <laughs> I've given some of these really heavy ones with so much information, and I know that it's like taking a drink from a fire hose. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it, there's a lot of information going out here. That's one of the reasons that we give you these Bible studies mm -hmm. to, um, they, they are looking at some of the same material and it helps you to be able to have that soak factor. Um, but the, the, reason we, the reason we do this, and I know we're covering a lot of material, mm -hmm. is that it, it begins to give us a big picture. And um, even though you may be getting the high points, it's giving a framework for understanding as you do continued Bible study. But um, f as for me, when, uh, when I was going through this, um, I, my sense was suddenly I was taken to this place where I realized how much more involved God is in this world how present he is, how powerful he is, mm. how loving he is, mm -hmm. and it radicalized my life because um, to see to see how all these pieces fit together is uh, is a wonderful, wonderful exercise. So, yeah. um, thank you for your patience, and I know that um, that it, that it, there is a saturation mm. that takes place, but um, but know that. Uh, uh, one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us at different times, the Holy Spirit can take all that stuff that's pouring into this beautiful instrument called the brain, and he can touch certain places and bring things to memory as mm -hmm. well. True. So, um, so um, it, it's all working for something, and God is right in the midst of it. So thank you for that. Hey, thanks for the Q&A, Rick. Okay. 
Well, let's uh, start as we always do with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for this opportunity to be together again. Thank you that your Holy Spirit um, gives us wisdom and understanding that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And Lord, for the subject tonight, I, I just pray that you would just make it come alive and um, that, uh, that the words that are spoken will be words in due season. And we pray this in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Open and unchanging God. You know, I, I, uh, I have this really precocious grandson who, um, who uh, asked me if I would play a game with him. I said, well, I don't know, I don't know anything about that game. And he said, oh, uh, Gramps, don't, don't worry, I'll, I'll teach you as we go along. And uh, so as we were uh, playing the game and I was starting to get a feel for it, um, he would announce to me, oh, um, th there's another rule. So, you know, and, um, and so uh, as we went along, I started realizing that, that uh, uh, these rules were popping up uh, for his advantage at, at, the, at the different times. And... Um, he, uh, he, he, had a, he had a lot of fun with that. But um, I've also worked for supervisors, you know, that, that um, um, were, were critical or uh, hard to get along with. And it, and it seemed like they were, always, they were always finding fault or adding a new rule. Or, um, and, and it can get really discouraging when somebody seems so changeable. And, um, and especially if, if they'd come in with different moods every day, you know. But the, the good news today is that our God is an unchanging God. Our God is, you know, uh, I love that, that uh, the Apostle John, the Beloved, said, God, simply, God is love. God is love, and that love never changes. And somewhere along the line, I realized that I couldn't make God love me more by what I did. I couldn't make God love me less by what I did. He just loves us. It's, it's very different in this world. You know, oftentimes we find approval and appreciation for what we do, and, and we can feel, feel love, but it can become very manipulative, right? But God just loves us. He loves us all the time. He is an unchanging God. He always gives us that hope that he is an unchanging God. And, and that's good news. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, he declares it. For I am the Lord, I do not change. He doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as a matter of fact, that's how Jesus is described in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is this thing that we can count on, that God loves us, that he never changes. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He just loves us. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, we read, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. The everlasting gospel. You know, oftentimes people will, um, will say, well, in these times, this is how people were saved. In these times, these, this is how people were saved. And, you know... They, they, they were saved by keeping the law. We're saved by grace. But, but here in Revelation, it's saying the everlasting gospel, that it's unchanging. An unchanging God has set an unchanging way of saving people, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting good news, that, that God is in the business of changing. You know, one of the things I... Uh, uh, not changing, excuse me. He, he's the same. One of the things I, I, uh, I learned, speaking of supervisors, I used to have this supervisor who was, who was oh, just so difficult to work for. And I, I found I could do nothing right. And even when I did something right, he would point out the last time I, I messed up. And, you know, I would work so hard for him trying to, trying to get myself fixed right so that I did everything correctly and, and pleased him. 
I never could. And um, I don't even remember his name. But I, I worked for, um, for another man, the first man that really believed in me and taught me how to be a man. Uh, his name was Charlie Johnson. And he is a hero of, of, uh, of, my, of my life. He, uh, he was, he was um, one who gave me the luxury of failing and was always encouraging me and removing roadblocks and helping me and, and um, leading me t- into new ways of doing things. And I came to realize that this is the God that, that we serve. If it's the God who is always looking for something wrong, always looking for the mistakes, always, you know, thumping us and hitting, um, as one friend once said, a smite button, you know, um, we, we, get, we get very discouraged with a God like that. That's not really God. God is an unchanging God, a loving God, a caring God. And when we come to know that God who is removing the roadblocks and helping us to, uh, to become who he's called us to be, well, we just want to serve him. You know, and he begins to do things in us and transform us from the inside out. The everlasting gospel, that's the God that we have. He has always been the same. The gospel has always been the same. There are no multiple plans of salvation. There's one, and that is in Jesus Christ. For those in the past, looking forward to the deliverer, the Messiah. For those on the other side of the resurrection, looking to Jesus the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who rose from the dead and conquered death for us. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, we read, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. It's always been the same. Jesus Jesus was with the Jews in the wilderness. He He was that presence. God is unchangeable. But as we previously studied with this little horn, um, it made that bold claim that it could change times and laws. That it could change God, literally. That this little horn power on the earth in the dark ages could change God. And we, um, we saw evidences over the last couple of lectures of, of that little horn trying to do just that. But God is unchangeable. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We see of the little horn in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Change times and laws. Imagine believing that it would be possible to change God. Now, I have to, I have to admit There have been prayers, especially in my earlier faith life, where I tried to change God's mind with my impassioned prayer. But, but, you know, the thing is, is that God will not change in order to give me what I want because he loves me too much to give me what I want. Sometimes, sometimes, um, and, and most often when I pray, it's to, it's to come to that place where I am in, in trust with God, trust his heart, and know that he will work whatever this is for good. He's an unchanging God, and it's good that, that, uh, that we can have that. To try to change God, it just isn't going to work. To think that you can change times and laws. Can you change God's times and laws? Well, God gave us the Ten Commandments as the great moral standard Uh, of the universe, and these were precepts given to last forever. They are eternal. In the 21st century, there are those who question the validity of the Ten Commandments Um, and, and these great precepts that God gave us that reveal himself in in those precepts. In the 21st century, there um there is this this wonderful man, Billy Graham, uh the late Billy Graham Um, amazing, amazing man. He says, the Ten Commandments, all of them, are just as valid today as they were when God gave them to his people thousands of years ago. God does not change, and neither does his basic moral standard. This from the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association in Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
Billy Graham knew that the Ten Commandments were still valid today. And um, it's, it's, you know, someone might say, well, we're not under the law, but have you met a Christian that will justify killing somebody? Or that justifies law, uh, a, a murder, or uh, stealing, or any of those moral standards that keep our culture and our society balanced? Of course that, that, um, that, that law is still valid. Now, not all preachers are, are as honest with the scripture as Billy Graham, and, and uh, to claim that um, that Im immortal code is no longer binding, it just, it just doesn't make sense. It's, it's there. It is the glue that holds our, our culture, our society in order. And you can see, I mean, those of us who have been on the earth for a few decades recognize that as we have moved further and further away from these moral precepts, our culture is, is in a state of decline. Um, unbelievable, some of the things that are happening. And most, I think most disturbing is the value of life is being counted as cheaper and cheaper. Um, and it's, it's a scary thing. Um, for those in the beginning of life and those at the end of life, it does not look good <laughs> with the way our culture is going. Now, D.L. Moody, who was a shoe salesman and became a great evangelist, wrote this. He says, now men may cavil or argue or discuss, may cavil as much as, uh, as they like about other parts of the Bible, but I have never met an honest man that found fault with the Ten Commandments. This from D.L. Moody, Wade and Wanting. Um, very important that we recognize the, the centrality of the Ten Commandments in our faith. Agree? All right. Needless to say, those ten eternal rules are no longer palatable in our modern society, though. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot, of, a lot of structure disappearing in terms of how people get along with one another. It would appear that these people... That, the, that to these people that the law and grace are opposed. That they, you know, we, we want freedom. We want to be able to live free and do what we want. But what we, what we uh, so when we look at the, the Ten Commandments, as the, I mean, they cramp our style, right? They, they don't, they, they kind of they step on our toes. And um, so... But I want to take a moment right now to say, keeping the law will never save us. It doesn't save us. The law has a very specific function, but it, salvation is not it. It's never going to save us. Now suppose I am uh, driving over the speed limit. Um, occasionally I am a faster pastor. <laughs> and um, so I'm driving over the speed limit. I've got a, a passenger in the car. And uh, there are the lights in my rearview window, uh, mirror, you know, and I see them flashing. And, you know, a little, little, uh, <gasps> and, uh, and then you, you hope that, you know, you kind of slow down and you hope that he'll just go right on by you and get the next person, but no, it's you. Am I, am I uh, speaking in too realistic a term? Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway. So, so he pulls you over, and he walks up to your car. You roll down the window. You've got your insurance and papers out and everything. And, uh, and the officer says, uh, in a hurry today? You know how it goes. Anyway, um, you, you look at the fine on that, on that ticket, and the guy sitting next to you says, I'm going to pay that for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay that for you and take the penalty for what you just did. So, um, I, hey, I feel pretty good about that. So when I pull out, I go double the speed limit. No, that's not the way it works, right? <laughs> so just so if God forgave us and, and we just went on doing, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. What <laughs> because we're, we're under his grace, is uh, presumption, isn't it? Yeah. I think one of the things that the law does for us is that we, we come up against that and we recognize our need for a Savior. 
we recognize that we cannot change ourselves. That's what the law does for us. So let's continue on. The law and grace are inseparable. Uh, the presence of the law demands grace, and the presence of the law um, is, is, reveals that the law was violated. One of the, especially as uh, Dr. Arvey talked about addiction, one of, the, one of the crucial steps to overcoming addiction, one of the crucial steps for uh, overcoming any, any harmful behavior is to recognize that you have a problem. If, if, you, th <laughs> if you are living in... All right. I think we have power. No worries. Don't ever, don't ever let anybody tell you you're a low voltage pastor. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> so the presence of the law demands grace, and the presence of grace reveals that there, that there is a law that has been violated. And uh, just getting back to, back to that point again, until we recognize that we've got a problem, we are not in the place where we are ready to be healed. We, we, um, we, we can go through this denial. Sin came out of the garden, and um, some, 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 um, the, some who have read the Bible, you see one little thing, and it starts, it starts multiplying and multiplying over those first chapters of Genesis, we see just how sin um, has, has ruined, has ruined the, the, uh, the beautiful paradise that God had created, that beautiful Edenic garden. So um, claims that the Old Testament God saved people by different ways, um, uh, the, and the New Testament is the only place where we're saved by grace, doesn't make sense that a God who used one plan here and another plan here, um, that same God gives us the same way to be saved. David, uh, you know, in Psalm 51, uh, a little off script here, but David in Psalm 151, or Psalm 51, got it. He said, when he was confronted with his sin with Bathsheba, he said, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. This is creation language. Create in me a clean heart. This is something that only God can do. We cannot change ourselves. Like I, I've said earlier, um, we can be like a whack-a-mole, you know, where they pop up and you're supposed to hammer it down, that little game, and it pops up somewhere else, and then it pops up somewhere else, and you can never, you can never get them all. Um, when, when we are controlled by sin, it pops up here. You may try and get that under control, but then it's going to pop up somewhere else. The only way that we can truly be changed and transformed is by God changing us from the inside out. And so... Um, uh, if you got to heaven and you found out that somebody got there by, by um, living a perfectly compliant um, life to the law, other than Jesus, um, it, you would ne hear no end of bragging about it, right? <laughs> I 
I did it. I didn't need God. No, the truth is that we, uh, that's, that's a lie. And um, so um, listen to this. This is really interesting. Um, God didn't give the Ten Commandments to Moses and the people of Israel until he had delivered them from bondage. Okay? God did not deliver them from the Egyptians and bondage in, in Egypt. He delivered them first, and then he gave them the law. That's, that's a beautiful concept right there, that he baptized them through the, through the sea, delivered them, not by their works, delivered them from Egypt. He was that pillar of of uh, fire by night and the, and the cloud by day that stood between the Egyptians and the Israelites. He parted the Red Sea. They crossed in safety. God delivered them before he gave them the law. Isn't that beautiful? Um, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through 3, this is the first sentence before the, the rest of the Ten Commandments. He says, oops, yeah, it was there. Let's go back. Okay. Um, the first sentence, in, uh, first sentence in Exodus is, And God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. We oftentimes have that. We, we, we cut that off and go right into the Ten Commandments. But here is God's salvation stated before the giving of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that beautiful? It's an amazing thing. Um, and so we, we, can't, uh, we can't discount that. We can't forget that. Law-keeping is only given to people whom God has redeemed by his grace. <laughs> Law and grace in the New Testament. Old Testament people... Send, uh, say, were saved only by grace, and then they were given the Ten Commandments as a free gift. After Jesus arrived, the Old Testament had become so corrupt, uh, the Old Testament religion had become so corrupted by the people. What had happened was um, when, when Israel went into uh, captivity in Babylon, because of their because of their wickedness and the, and the pagan practices that had crept into the church. They were in captivity in Babylon for 75 years. And when, when they were in Babylon, certain of the Jews began to, to look at how to get back to God. And so that is the origin of the Pharisees. That as they, as they learned God's word, restudied it, and began to, began to incorporate it back into their life. But over generations, they began to subdivide and become more and more focused on details, making all of these heavy rules to obey in order to keep the law. And so the people began to lose touch with a living, loving God because their religion became rules. It became dry and formal and un, unnatural to what God really wanted them to have. So Jesus came into the world to reveal the love of God and the, the, the true faith. Emphasis on obedient, uh, obedience apart from a love relationship with God um, is, 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 is a dry, formless religion. God's beautiful plan of, of salvation was distorted by a list of legal rules that, that fed into that human focus of trying to do it. Um, I, had a, I had a good friend who had a phrase. He said, you know, when we get into, into a, a religion of rules, we become like lemon-sucking Pharisees. Much of the New Testament was written to help early Christians return to the grace orientation. Um, you know, you think of uh, the book of Galatians that Paul wrote. 
and he had taught them about he had taught them about the grace and the love of God. And then um, what were called Judaizers came in and began to bring them back into a rule focus. And Paul writes to the Galatians, he says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you and, and, and put you back into this old bondage? Um, because, you know, Paul experienced life before. He was, he was a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law faultless, as it's written in, in uh, Philippians chapter 3. He had seen it from both sides. And when he met Jesus, the whole focus of his life changed. And he began, I mean, one of the most beautiful things, for, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, written by Paul. You know, love is patient, love is kind. It does, it's not boastful. It doesn't demand its own way. Paul experienced the love of God, and it, it gave his life a whole new perspective and direction because God is a God of love and grace. So what does the uh, New Testament um, declare about the law? Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says this, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till, it all, is till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. One, one thing is clear. Jesus did not change the relationship between the law and grace. The law is still there. He says it's not going to change, not one jot or tittle of the law. Those were the tiniest punctuation marks in Hebrew. Um, and uh, so as long as heaven and earth continue, the law will be there. Um, and Jesus even intimates what Daniel predicted, that somebody then would try to change the law. Jesus wouldn't have to make this statement if there wasn't going to be an attack on the law. He, ha he, he, he saw that, and he makes this strong statement. So the law and grace are inseparable. Let's look at a couple passages, again from uh, one of my personal heroes, Paul. In Romans chapter 3, verse 31, he says, Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. So we, we, in our faith, we establish the purpose and the function of the law. It's not an enemy to us. Paul was clear, we were saved by grace but, um, and our faith in Jesus. But the law has, has a function. The Apostle John, writing near the end of the first century, John was the the, the, uh, the, the movie uh, of the book of John that we're looking at, it was written probably uh, around 90 to 93 uh, A.D., late in John's life. And um, so he's writing near the end of the first century and uh, had to battle those who um, had gone to extremes, even in early Christianity, and were declaring that one not... Need, need not keep the law anymore. And John, the apostle of love, writes this. Who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his, his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to to walk just as he walked. You see, if, if you know Jesus, you will be obedient. If you know Jesus and he is alive in you, you will become more and more a reflection of him in your life and your choices. There's, uh, <laughs> I guess what, one thing that I have to say 
is that there are a lot of things that I used to do that have fallen away from my life. I don't miss them. <laughs> I don't miss them. But every now and then, um, there may be some new thing that I do, and it's like, oh, why did I do that? Why am I struggling with this? But you know, I'm not, I'm not happy in that. I don't want to see that as a part of my life. I, I can't do it and be satisfied with my life because it's going against something that is core in my life. I want to live in the, in the freedom that, that Jesus has given me. So it's a hard obedience. When I was um, um, struggling to come to grips with this concept of the law and grace, the Ten Commandments and grace, I was growing in grace, you know, and, and, and I was just, uh, just experiencing Jesus in a powerful way. Uh, Cheryl and I had moved away from our hometown in Buffalo where we were deeply involved in the Presbyterian Church. We had a children's choir, and, um, and we, I was an elder in the church. And when we moved away uh, to St. Louis for a job, uh, we, were, we had no friends or family, and we were experiencing God in a whole new way. And, um, and then uh, I came to the circumstance where, where the law was coming into my life, and I'm, and I'm trying to struggle between the law and grace, the law and grace. And so finally, the way I reconciled it for myself was I made these two columns, all of the scriptures on, on the law that I could find, all of the scriptures on grace that I could find, and they seemed to be opposite of each other. And, um, and then I remembered this, this Bible study. We used to meet at Shoney's Restaurant at 6.30 in the morning, and we studied the book of Jeremiah. And all of a sudden, it just came to my mind, where is that passage? Where is that passage? And it's in Jeremiah 31, 33. It says, the time is coming when I will write my law on your hearts and your mind. And then I realized that's how grace and law come together. That's where they kiss in our hearts. And so, um, Jeremiah, but this is the covenant that I will make with, um, with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, um, the, this, is, this is like my favorite person on the earth, Cheryl. <laughs> we met in high school. I was a senior, and she was a junior. Uh, we've been married, uh, we're into our 42nd year now, and one of the things I've found is that out of, out of that love relationship, we, we make changes in ourselves because of our love for each other. Cheryl knows th little things that, that make me happy. I know little things that make her happy. So I change, I change to do those things that put a little extra spark in her day. And she does the same thing for me. You know, and, and it's, it, it, that's a, a reflection of what happens when we have a love for God. That, that we know the things that, that please him, and he certainly knows the things that please us. And that relationship is a transformative relationship. It's a journey of faith as we grow together. In Revelation uh, chapter 14, 12, the last day people are described this way. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Notice the faith of Jesus and the commandments are together. They, they work together. The last day people have that proper relationship between law and grace because it's all about a relationship. It's about knowing Jesus. It's about allowing him in your heart, allowing him to, to be that, that presence. And um, one of the things I, I, I have appreciated so much, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God literally takes our, our brokenness and he begins to rewire our minds so that we perceive things differently. When we see things differently, we respond differently. 
we become healthy. Our resp- those old unhealthy responses begin to fall away, and we begin to see life in a whole new perspective. It's God's law being written in our hearts and transforming us. The law and the character of God are, are brought into us because God is a holy God. John declares in uh, 1 John 3, verse 4, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. The law defines the character of God. In Romans, what shall we say then? Is the, is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. The law reveals sin to us. Each commandment reveals something about the character of God. The first commandment, no other gods, tells us God is unique. The second commandment, forbidding images, God is the only one worthy of our worship. The third commandment protects the name of God. God calls people to reverence his name. Fourth commandment, commands to keep the Sabbath and reminds us that God is a God of relationships and to remember that he is the creator. It is a centering, a centering commandment right there, the fourth commandment. The fifth commandment, honors the family unit that he created. And then the sixth commandment forbid, forbids murder. God is the author of life, and life is sacred. The seventh commandment, forbidding ag- adultery. God is pure. He calls for purity. Eat, each, the eighth commandment forbids stealing. God is honest, and his love is always others-centered. God is completely others-centered. In the life of Jesus, we see that, that right down to the place where he made himself a servant, right? As, uh, as Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, the ninth commandment uh, forbids false witness. God is truthful. The tenth commandment forbids coveting. God respects the security of people and their property. Each reveals something about the character of God. God has an unblemished character. When Jesus asked what the what is the most important com- was asked what is the most com- important commandment, he quoted in Matthew 22 verses 37 to 39, "You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself." Well, and, and this is kind of interesting. If you look at the first four commandments, it's about our relationship with God. The last six commandments is about our relationship with one another. And the cross is right in those ten commandments because the first four are the vertical relationship. That comes first, our relationship with God. And the, the last six commandments spills over to our relationship with one another because it's about people. The cross is in, is in the Ten Commandments. The vertical relationship produces the horizontal relationships. So Jesus was actually quoting the Old Testament. Here in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, um, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And then the second one came from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Both of those quoting the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 13, verse 10, Paul writes, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And again, in 1 John 4, verse 8, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So you can see that it's the love of God pouring into us that also 
pours out of us in our relationship. God is indeed unchangeable. God is unchangeable, and yet this little horn power from the dark ages seeks and intends to change time and laws. The little horn could change the law, and then, if it could, would change God. But God is unchangeable. When sin entered the world, God faced two choices. Change the law to allow sin, which would have destroyed the holy God, or God would send his son to pay the penalty of the law, which would reveal that God is unchangeable and his standard beyond question. This is, this is the love of God. In Romans chapter 3, verse 20, we read, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. If we did not have the law, we would not understand what sin is. We would not recognize it. And just like I said with addiction, until you realize you have a problem, you are not in a place where you're ready to change. Here's a beautiful depiction from an artist showing the effect of the law. The law is like a mirror. We see ourselves in the mirror of God's perfect character, and we recognize that we need a Savior. The law has that function, not to save us, but to turn us to the Savior, Jesus. That is the beautiful, beautiful function of the law. In Romans chapter 7, verse 12, we read this, Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. And from James chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, we read, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and, do, and, and so do as, the, as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. And, and it, you know, you read, you read that in that last thing, the law of liberty. That means the law of freedom. The law turns us to the one who gives us freedom from our sins, Jesus. That is the function of the law. To be saved, he or she needs Jesus. No matter how small the sin, you and I are all the same. There is no great degree of separation. When I became a pastor, I came to realize I have no bragging rights. <laughs> I've, made, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes in my lifetime but I know a loving Savior, and his name is Jesus. He is the one who has brought me to this place. And so, um, can that little horn power change God's law? That's where we're going tomorrow uh, for, our, um, for our last lecture. Um, it's impossible, and yet, and yet, um, we have evidence of the Dark Ages Church and the changes that it brought into this world today. Tomorrow, our talk will be hope in a relationship with an unchanging God. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, thank you for this, uh, for this time that you've given us. Thank you that you are unchanging and that your, your perfect character is like a reflection to show us the need for a perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that, that you have given us this gift, and thank you for what we have learned tonight. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Good night. God bless.